Good morning, friends, and welcome to this service of worship on this Lord's Day from St. Paul United Methodist Church, downtown Ocean Springs. Thank you for joining us, and we pray you will be blessed during this time of worship together. Opening hymn is Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Let us sing together. Let us unite together in the affirmation of faith, which is the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We come to that time when we lift up our prayers together as God's people and we listened 
we listen in prayer to our Lord, the Lord our God. To those of you who are joining us online, uh, if you have prayer requests or concerns, please feel free to send those to us, share those with us through email or through any other communication mechanisms. We do have a prayer ministry here at St. Paul. We invite you to take advantage of. Uh, let us pray together as God's people. O oh Lord our God, on this first Sunday of Advent, we acknowledge you as the God of hope who leads us forward into good things and into your future, not made with human hands, but eternal in the heavens. You call us to goodness and to lead us and lead us on right paths. You encourage us with signs of your coming and urge us to keep watch that we might greet you with our heads raised high when you come to restore all of creation. Watching and waiting, we pray for this world that needs your saving power. We pray for nations at war. We pray for all who suffer, including those who suffer from violence in the streets or in their homes. In your mercy, Lord. For all who live in worry or fear, in your mercy, Lord, save us. For those who have forgotten the ways of righteousness, for those who have never heard of your rescuing love, for those who have lost hope or never had it at all, in your mercy, Lord, save us. Today we pray also for your church in the world that we may increase in ardor for you and your children and work in confidence for your coming reign. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, make us ever more faithful that we may greet you in confidence and joy on that great day. Through Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray, these words that he also taught his disciples, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It is a good and right and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to offer to God in response to God's blessings to us, offer our offerings. And so we do that now at this point in our service, giving thanks to God for all of them. Uh, you may give to St. Paul, as you may well know, online at give.stpaulos.org through the mail. St. Paul, UMC, P.O. Box 909, Ocean Springs. Thank you for your continued faithfulness in this area. And may God bless you. Let us now pray together our offertory prayer. God of righteousness, you, you have, have saved, saved us from the worst the, the world can do and, and have, have promised to redeem the whole creation when Christ comes again. In faith and hope, we offer our gifts of money and self that we may be part of what you are doing in the world even now as we watch for Christ's coming in glory. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you. 
The Gospel lesson for this first Sunday in Advent is Luke 21, beginning with verse 25. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth distress among nations, confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory, now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church. I'll be your flight attendant today, and I have to warn you that we are in for a bumpy ride. The turbulence is predictable because there are two different weather patterns that always collide on this Sunday, the first one in Advent. The first one is a high pressure front. Today is the New Year's Day for the church, for Christians, the first Sunday of the new church year, which sets our sights on the birth of the Messiah four weeks from now. Good news, Christ is coming. It's time to get the nursery ready and reorder your priorities because every urgent thing in your life is about to kneel before the important thing about to be born in you. Emmanuel, we sing, which is to say, the God in you, the God in the person sitting next to you, the God with us, the God above us, the God below us and among us, willing to be made known through us, and at the same time willing to become small enough to hold in our arms. This baby's on its way. So you'd expect champagne to be served on this flight, but the happy high-pressure front is only one of the strong currents under our wings today. The other is a stormy, low-pressure front causing the captain to see some strange things below, out of the window. Christ is still coming, but in a cloud this time. Cabin service has been suspended due to the apocalypse, and we're all sitting in exit rows. You don't remember saying you would assist in case of emergency? I'm afraid it's too late to change seats now. You, me, Emmanuel, we're all buckled in and we're all in this together. This morning's gospel is our wake-up call, and it, it may take a while to hear the good news in it. You just heard one version of it from Luke's gospel. The backstory is that Jesus was in the temple in Jerusalem. There were a bunch of people standing around remarking what a grand place it was and how grand it was to, to be there. It was maybe something like the Washington National Cathedral, if you've ever been there. The place so packed with people trying to get a good angle with their selfie sticks so that no one could see much of anything else. Maybe it was the sheer size of the place that stunned them. Whatever version of that was going on inside the temple, Jesus was irritated by it, by the wealth, the splendor, the gawking. It seemed all wrong to him, so he decided it was the perfect teaching moment. Before people could head down to the gift shop for the souvenir postcard or talk a 
about where they would go to lunch. He said something loud enough for those standing around there to hear. Don't get too attached, he said, because it's all coming down. Mm. Since, you know, it's easy to doze while you're listening to a familiar translation, here's another one from Eugene Peterson's message uh, that may be different enough for a fresh hearing. This is verses 25, 26, 27, 28. It will seem like all hell has broken loose. Sun, moon, stars, earth, sea, in an uproar, and everyone all over the world in a panic. The wind knocked out of them by the threat of doom, the powers that be quaking. And then, then, they'll see the Son of Man welcomed in grand style, a glorious welcome, when all, all of this starts to happen. Up on your feet, stand tall with your heads high, help is on the way. A few verses later he continues, but be on your guard, don't let the sharp edge of your expectation get dulled by parties and drinking and shopping. Otherwise, that day is going to take you by complete surprise. Spring on you suddenly like a trap, for it's going to come on everyone, everywhere at once. So whatever you do, don't fall asleep at the wheel. Pray constantly that you will have the strength in which to make it through everything that's coming and end up on your feet before the Son of Man. Earth and sea in an uproar, global panic, the threat of doom, the powers quaking. I don't know about you, but I don't need much reminding about such things. You know, I hear them on the television every morning, hear about them on the news every night. I read about them in the pages of the newspaper that comes to my house. I see them in the, in the previews of movies. A professor at a Catholic school of theology asked a group if they had heard about the Hallmark explosion. Now, given some of the terrible things that have been in the headlines, they, they thought he meant an actual explosion. Oh no, someone said, trying to think about where the Hallmark headquarters were. Was anyone hurt? But he meant the ratings had exploded. Over the last year, years, the Hallmark television channel uh, had zoomed to the top tier of the cable channels with offerings like uh, Where the Heart Is, Love Came Softly in My Dreams, etc., as different as those dramas are, <clears throat> what they have in common are happy endings. The characters in them do the right thing. And problems are resolved, you know, without anyone getting hurt. Not too badly, anyway. Sweethearts finally get together. Uh, that one time, at one time, Hallmark's network ratings surpassed CNN's. And when December comes, the Christmas lineup puts Hallmark neck and neck with Fox and ESPN. I totally get it. You know, we're living in scary times with or without newspaper uh, subscriptions and social media and live streaming. It's hard to imagine anyone who can avoid the anxiety that pervades our culture. It comes up in texts, in telephone conversations, even around dinner tables on nights out with friends. Something as slight as a see-through straw can uh, conjure up images of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is 79,000 tons of floating plastic. Mention the midterm elections that will be coming up next year during app appetizers, and you'll be, somebody will be talking about the end of Western democracy by dessert. <laughs> There's a lot of ways people handle their anxiety, and the Hallmark Channel is probably the most benign. Shopping also works for some people, gin and sedatives for others. But since we are in a church this morning, there's a good reason to return to the gospel teaching for its clues to how Christians have lived with their anxiety from the start. Best guess is that Luke's gospel dates to the last decades of the first century, which means that he had lived through the end of the world a couple of times over. Not just the crucifixion of Jesus, but also the executions of Peter, and James and Paul, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, Nero's persecution of the early church, perhaps even the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 70 Christian era, which rocked the ancient world with 100,000 times more thermal energy than the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined. So Luke was an eyewitness to all of these things, but like most of us, he got most of his headlines from a distance, 
uh, yeah, but doomsday was not lurking somewhere in the future for him. It was past and it was present. It was the reality in which he wrote his gospel, doing his best to set down the saving news of Jesus for those who were caught up in it too. How did Jesus speak to their anxiety? Most importantly, I think, he did not tell them to cut it out. Just cut it out. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, he said. Who could have known better than him? Terrible things happen, and you have to be made out of metal instead of flesh to be fearless in the face of what might happen next. Jesus knew that. At one of the lowest moments of his life, he asked to be spared from what was coming next. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. At the same time, he knew that was not his call. Yet, my will, not my will, but yours be done. This is a lifesaver, to know that the one we call Lord and Savior also knew fear and foreboding. He was made of tender flesh, just like we are. Even he had to learn what could be changed and what did not. If his courage was superior to ours, it wasn't because he was anxiety-free, but because he kept moving in spite of it. He also knew that God was to have something that involved breaking before it involved mending, which means that the terrible things were not all coming from the enemy. That tumult that Jesus was warning people about, the uproar, the panic, the doom, it wasn't being caused by some malignant assault from the underworld, but by the gravitational pull of the kingdom of God drawing near. And so he says, now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. This is mind-bending for those of us who think we know what redemption looks like, who believe, you know, we are competent to judge whether something is coming from the enemy or from God. But there you have it. Jesus' life-saving news is that our redemption is embedded in the things that cause the greatest anxiety. Hmm. To go back to the flight attendant metaphor for a moment, you might think about the last time you hit, hit some fairly rough, rough enough turbulence uh, to make the overhead compartments pop open maybe, or maybe to, at least to make you grab the armrests tightly, to look around to see if anyone is as frightened as you, you feel. <laughs> the minute you realize there's nothing you can do about any of this, your priorities change fast. Uh, the humanity of the person in the seat next to you becomes as precious as your own. And then the plane evens out you know, more smoothly and you go back to reading your magazines. But I'll tell you what, there's nothing like some big time turbulence to teach you how to pray. You can learn about what really matters to you in a moment like that, which has nothing to do with losing your luggage or making it to your next meeting in time. Since Jesus is not attached to the same things we are, he can take the God view, which is about more than redeeming our individual lives. God means to redeem the world, you know, which is going to require some major teardown before the global renewal project can go forward. In this view, there's some divine bulldozing to be done some cosmic asbestos removal to be completed before the world is safe for God's creation to live, live in again. All the systems and powers and economies that keep us separated into first class and coach, they're doomed already. All the tribal politics that thrive on us, making us fear and loathe each other, every kind of religion that demonizes a stranger or violates the young, it's all coming down. Jesus will not soften the message, but he does rebrand it. When you see these things begin to take place, he says, stand up and raise your head because your redemption is drawing near. That's not Satan coming in the cloud or your most despised politician or, you know, the mother of all hurricanes. It's him, the son of man, coming and 
power and great glory. And if you can let that in, even a little, you've opened the door for God to sanctify your anxiety. The last thing Luke records Jesus as saying today is that it's really important not to, not to let your worries make us check out. That's something else he knows about us, how likely we are to lie down when it's time to stand up, to cover our heads when it's time to raise them. <clears throat> and when the turbulence gets really bad, it's tempting to retire from as much reality as we can, right? And you know how that works, or at least you know how that works for you. Lower the room darkening shades, settle in for a full season of some other world other than your own <laughs> as you stream on Netflix. Cover the bed with mail order catalogs or empty pizza boxes. Do anything, do anything that works to take your mind off of what's really going on. Some people can even use the church to take their minds off reality. But none of us have come here for hot chocolate this morning. We've come here for the kind of truth we're not getting anywhere else in our lives. And as hard as it is sometimes to hear, Jesus promises that it will save our lives because the one who comes to us first as the son of Mary in a manger comes again as the son of man in a cloud, not just once, but over and over again. Luke thought the end of the world was coming to an end in his times. Grave diggers during the Black Plague were sure it was happening in theirs. Soldiers in the Great War thought they were living in the last days. If you were in the trenches, you would, we would have too. During the last hours of 1999, millions of people prepared for doom. You remember those days as the clock swept toward Y2K? Maybe the end is already coming at us in some form or another so that every generation you know, gets some practice at apocalypse before we pass away. That's what Jesus says anyway. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. This is the heart of, of teaching about how to live with anxiety. While everything else in heaven and older is bound to come to an end, his words will not. They will go on making sounds even if there is no one left to hear, hear that. In the meantime, in the meantime, there is a deathlessness about them, a deathlessness about them that holds out its hands to us, giving us a way to live even when we feel scared to death. <laughs> But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Luke six twenty seven to 31. When the baby is born in a few weeks from now, you won't nearly be able to articulate. He won't be able to articulate. Babies don't do that. All he'll be able to do is cry for his mother Mary's milk, maybe curl his finger around Joseph's, you know. But these words will be forming in him along with many others so that when he speaks with them at last, uh, we will not only be able to hear them coming out of his mouth, but also see them leafing out through his life a way that he commends to us also. Any kind of life we can live in through and beyond the headlines while we stand up wide awake and full of purpose to take part in the coming of God's reign at last. Thanks be to God. Our concluding hymn is All Earth is Waiting. Let us sing together. <laughs>
struggling seeks true liberty. It cries out for justice and searches for the truth. Thus says the prophet to those of Israel, a virgin mother will bear Emmanuel, for his name is God with us, our brother shall be. Go forward this week in the living hope of Christ our Lord and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit abide with you always. See you next time. Thank you.